Hello, I am Ronan Chris Murphy from Recording Bootcamp, and today I have another recording gear review for you. And this time it is the Flux Bender from Lightning Boy Audio. So you've probably never heard of the Flex Bender. You've probably never heard of Lightning Boy Audio. And the reason for that is Lightning Boy Audio is the very definition of small boutique gear manufacturer. I'm pretty sure it is just one guy making all of these by hand, wiring by hand, making tons of the components, even things like the capacitors and stuff by hand, which most other audio companies would just sort of buy in from somewhere else. And I'm fairly certain that even the front panel is hand etched. All the labeling and stuff for the frequency selectors is done by hand. That's just a guess, but it sure looks that way. But it still actually looks really nice. The first thing you're gonna notice about the flex bender, and then I'll tell you what it is, is this thing. <laughs> this is a massive power supply. This is definitely the biggest, most badass power supply I have ever seen on a piece of 19 inch rack gear. Uh, again, some what appears to be hand etching. They call this the juice box. And again, just massive, massive transformer for this. So again, I'm not the smart enough, so I'm not a smart enough guy to know all the details why this one is better than another one, but man, is it impressive. And man, did clients go, what on earth is that thing on top of the rack when they came in? So what is the flux bender? Well, Unfortunately, the name leads you to believe that it's going to be something way more interesting than it really is. It's a passive EQ and uh, with a really groovy name. It's a really good passive EQ, but you know, it's not going to do anything like c communicate with extraterrestrials or anything like that. So it's a passive EQ and you know, when we talk about passive EQs, we're usually talking about like the classic Pultex or some of the newer modern similar kind of things like the Manly Massive Passive or you know, what I've got here, the A-Designs EM EQ2 or their uh, EMP EQs, which I've got a couple channels of as well. I'll let a way smarter guy explain the ins and outs of how it's done. But the thing with passive EQs is they tend to be big, bold, really, really smooth. So you can do a lot of big sculpting with them without them coming back and starting to get ugly or harsh or things like that. And uh, this one is definitely in that tradition. But where this gets really different than something like a Pultec or uh, these sort of aid designs, which are Pultec-like but solid state, is what you have on the traditional ones is you'll have like the low shelf and you'll have one frequency selector down there and then you'll have the ability to boost or attenuate there at the same frequency. And actually you can get some pretty interesting curves uh, actually doing that on this as well as the real Pultex. This on the other hand, the Flux Bender, actually has the low shelves right here for cutting and boosting, but they each have their own individual uh, frequency selector. So that is very different than what you could do on a, a Pultec or a Pultec style EQ. And that allows you a whole range of low end sculpting and curves that you could never do on something like an old traditional Pultec. Not going to say better or worse, but a lot more range of options, a lot more flexibility there. So what you've got across the front is you've got a uh, boost here and cut here. Again, both of these are low shelves. And then you've got cut here and uh, boost here. I kind of wish it was, you know, like boost, cut, boost, cut, or cut, boost, cut, boost, but there's probably some smart guy reason why it's done that way. But so we could select these independently, and then we've got the uh, low shelf, um, I'm sorry, then we've got the high shelf, which is cut only, and then the boost is a bell. And that's very similar to Pultex and Pultex style EQs. And then right here, we've got the flux interaction, which sounds super, super cool, but really, it's just kind of the, uh, the, uh, the cue for the bell boost. That said, it all sounds really, really good. And the nice thing about the range of the bell boost, as well as the slopes of the shelves, is they're all real gradual and smooth. Again, very typical of classic EQs 
meaning they're going to sound really good, maintain a lot of good phase cohesion, even when you start doing some more radical things. So um, with a box like this, it is hard to mess it up. It's hard to do things that sound bad, which actually is one of my little cons about it, is this actually does boosting in such a smooth way. I was actually mixing a project a few weeks ago, and I'd gotten really excited, and uh, I don't do a whole lot of boosting, but I was got really into it because it sounded so smooth, so sweet. And then I came back the next day and listened to it. I'm like, what have I done? I went way over the top. So I had to actually go back and redo some stuff because of that. But that's all right. There was time in the schedule. The last thing we've got here is just um, output controls, independent left and right, which is something I haven't told you. This is a stereo unit. Uh, and all of these controls are ganged together. So stereo unit, but a single set of controls except for the output controls. So of course you could run audio through just one side of it if you wanted to tweak a vocal or a bass, but you can't run left and right independently with separate controls. And I'm okay with that because that still gives us a ton of flexibility. So the pros and cons of this box, well, the first con we need to talk about is, as I mentioned, handmade boutique and associated price tag. Uh, this thing is $5,000, which in real money is a lot of money. That said, we need to put this in context. Handmade, boutique, uh, tender love and care all the way through. And it's right in the same price point as something like the Manly Massive Passive. I actually think it might even come in a little bit under Manly's Massive Passive. So in the range of this quality of build and the components and all the handmade TLC that goes into it, again, this is a lot of money, but it is not exorbitant in terms of realistic price points for something like this. So again, this isn't going to be for everybody, but if you are in a position to you know, expand your EQ collection to get things that are more boutique and unique and specific, this is worth considering and it is not really out of the range of what that kind of customer would expect to pay. The other thing that's a little bit of a con for me is that when we switch it from active and bypass, we're actually just bypassing the EQ circuit. We're still going through all of the tubes, transformers, uh, gain stage, all of that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, especially in a mastering context where I'm doing things at a very detailed level, I really like to be able to hardwire bypass a box like this and really get a sense of exactly what the box itself is bringing to the table. So I wish, actually I wish there was an additional option for a hardware uh, bypass. That said, I almost never wanted to not go through this. So I actually did a lot of tests where, you know, I just, in, especially in mastering, where we ran stuff through it and then compared it without running through it. And every time we chose this, every time we preferred the sound of audio going through this uh, versus not going through it. And when we get into this kind of level, it's hard to describe exactly what we heard. It's one of those things where like, oh, yeah, it just sounds pleasing. It's maybe a little bigger, a little more detailed. And we're not talking massive night and days, but every time we listen, it got better. So it didn't bum me out. And of course, you can always go in and repatch or bypass physically or things like that. So not the end of the world. The other thing that's kind of a con, but I can't really say that, um, it's more accurate to say one thing that sort of kicked my ass a little bit getting used to this is that the EQ, the different frequency points and how they overlap is not what you would expect. And uh, I actually ran into a wall where I was kind of getting freaked out because I was doing a whole bunch of, you know, experimenting with boosting uh, the bell up in the high end. And then like I'd be boosting up at like 22K and then like down to 4K. And it was really weird because I noticed I'd be boosting at 22K but hearing mid-range come forward, that just didn't make any sense to me, me at all. And then I figured it out, not my own genius, actually good customer support from the company that uh, these interact in ways that are not what you would expect. So actually to get this one to uh, react more like I had uh, expected a bell up at 22K uh, would actually react. You, when you just don't do any boosting, you haven't really turned this frequency off. Um, so what I had to do was actually go in, set this at 25K and do no boosting at all. And that gave me a curve in the high end that was much more predictable from what I was expecting. So again, I can't really fault that as a negative because 
you know, you don't buy a box like this because you want it to work just like you're used to. You buy a box like this because it's gonna bring something new to the table. And it does, the curves are unique, they've got their own tone, and it, and virtually every time I played with it, even when I was getting things that weren't what I was expecting, they were almost always better. So I can't whine about any of that. It was all actually very, very cool. Before we listen to some audio, I'll just sort of tell you one thing where I ended up using this the most, and that kind of surprised me, is when I think passive EQs, a lot of times I'm thinking of boosting. I'm not a big EQ booster in general. I try and do most of my work with subtractive EQ, but uh, where I, when I reach out to like an outboard passive EQ, that's usually where I'm starting to do a lot of boosting and tone shaping. But oddly enough, my favorite EQ setting on this for a lot of things was going down here to the cut, setting it at 32 uh, hertz. Again, that is a shelf, so I'm gonna cut there and just doing a little bit of cut in the low end. It kind of tightened up the low end, cleaned it up in a way that was really pleasing and made it more defined without losing a lot of the power and energy. So again, these things are so much fun for big boosts and crazy stuff, but where I actually got the most use out of this and where I will be the saddest that it's actually leaving is just how well the cut worked at the low, low frequencies. Clean things up in a beautiful way that was very different than my other tools. And those of you who have seen my studio know I have no shortage of really beautiful other tools for doing that kind of job. But that was my favorite thing here. The other stuff was also really, really good. So rather than me run my trap for much longer, let me just try and pull up some audio tracks and uh, take a listen what audio sounds like going through this. I'm gonna pull up a track uh, recently did for a great artist from Seattle named Kelly Bradley. And uh, this one, I loved, loved the record because I love working with Kelly, she's awesome. But this was also the first record I did when we sort of changed over to the new setup. So learned a lot on the way and uh, is also very happy that I think the record came out really wonderful. We're gonna be playing with the unmastered mix uh, for this. Um, I produced and mixed this and Diego Lopez engineered this with me. This was actually mastered in Seattle by the great Barry Corliss at Masterworks uh, up there in Seattle. And Barry is awesome, great mastering engineer. And so much of my development as an engineer was actually getting to be in sessions when Barry was mastering records for me. I just learned so much from the feedback and guidance I got from him. And uh, yeah, so much of what I know today was really a lot of the guidance from him when I really needed it, just by him mastering my records and keeping me on track. So let's get into uh, listening to Kelly Bradley and uh, seeing what this thing sounds like when we start cranking some knobs. You wanna make sure that you're watching this video in the highest quality video option that you've got. Uh, not because of my beautiful face, but because of uh, the higher the video quality, the higher quality the audio playback is, and some of this stuff might be a little bit on the subtle side. So let's go ahead and take a quick listen. So we've got everything here in its more or less most bypass state. Again, with it active, we cannot go in and turn everything off, but what we can do is push the EQ settings to their extreme highs and lows and put everything at its minimum cut or boost. And uh, I'm just gonna flip it back and forth um, and you can hear it. It may be a little subtle than you might pick up on a video here. But, uh, and last thing, this is Kelly Bradley's song and Kelly as an artist wanted this album to be a little more like in your face and aggressive than some, uh, some of the other things that she's done in the past. So uh, again, you might hear that even the cymbals and the voice are a little edgy and crunchier than you might uh, expect from you know, this sort of tune, but that's very intentional just with where Kelly was at as an artist and what she was trying to bring to the table for, uh, for this album. So here we go, let's check some things out. So first thing I'm gonna do is actually just that, uh, that thing I told you I really like, the, uh, the subtle bass cut. So I've got it at 35 hertz and at uh, no cut, and so I'm just gonna start gently uh, cutting a little bit off of that. Of course, that's a little bit too much. It's starting to thin out, so I wouldn't do that on a whole bus. But somewhere in between there, there's a spot where the bass gets a little less tubby and uh, a little more focused. Yeah, 
Yeah, so that little trick was actually one of my favorite things uh, of this uh, whole experiment. So let's go ahead and do something on the other end of the spectrum. So this, the flux interaction, we've got wide and focused. Uh, another manufacturer might call that narrow and wide, but let's put it right about 12 o'clock. And we're gonna do a little treble boost at uh, 15K. And let's just see how that sounds. It's a crying shame to come this far, a high price to pay for another scar. You said you knew me, you said you really had me down, but you didn't really. It's time for me to see how dramatically we can really alter this from actually feeling a little dark and murky to actually being very forward and very aggressive. And that's again, the beautiful thing about really well-designed uh, EQs with nice wide uh, curves. But uh, here, let me show you the thing that kind of got me <laughs> in trouble. Uh, so here we go, let's do, I'm gonna put this treble cut at 5K uh, and I'm going to leave it without any cut. Now I'm gonna do a boost here and you guys are gonna be able to hear the weird interaction of this. Listen how down here is 22K, up here is 4K. So 4K, 4.8. And listen how maybe the results aren't exactly what you might expect. You hear there how when we're up at 22K, it gets very mid forward, almost a little nasally, which is crazy. I never would have expected that. And truth is, I thought maybe he had wired this backwards, but uh, I got in touch with him. We spoke on the phone. He explained to me it has to do with how these two are interacting, even if you're not doing any cuts here. So now that we know that, uh, here, I'm going to go back to 22K and I'm actually going to adjust this one. Notice it's all the way cut. And I'm going to actually go in and uh, bring that up to 25K. And let's see if the mid-range sort of forward honk goes away. I've seen the damage and the look in your eyes before. I think it's a crying shame to come this far. A high price to pay for another scar. You said you knew me. Hear how that's how much that is changing the character of our boost here. And again, no cut at all. It just has to do with how these interact. So honestly, that was a little bit frustrating for me um, until I kind of figured out what was going on. And, and in some ways, it's still a little bit frustrating anyway. But uh, as I hope I've mentioned that even when I was frustrated with this EQ and, and it didn't respond in ways that I expected it to, Every time I listened with or without it, uh, I virtually every time really loved what it did in. So uh, one last thing, and then you just got to buy one and play with it for, with yourself. Uh, let me just show you what uh, the low end boost sounds like. It's really big, really rich and full. And uh, that's one thing I was really curious of because like a little 60 or 30 hertz boost on the low end. Uh, of this, one of my most used passive EQs here at the studio, is one of my favorite things, so I was excited to see what it would sound like here. And now let's try that at 35. So pretty big, pretty huge and powerful. And personally for two bus work, I didn't find that very useful. I actually found it too big and round. Um, this is much more the kind of thing that I would use on individual instruments, trying to add warmth to a bass or a guitar 
or, uh, or even an anemic kind of vocal, uh, I could actually bring in a lot of character. So actually, we're going to do this just on the whole mix, but listen here. If I start to bring this in, don't focus on what it's doing to the bass, but we can listen a little bit to what it's doing to the voice. So yeah, that is pretty big and bold and wide. Uh, but of course, this being one of these passive EQs with overlapping frequencies, we could even go in and start doing crazy things like this. Do a big boost here, and then start doing a shelving cut below that. Um. So there, we managed to get that big, round, uh, almost pillowy low end, but with this, clean it up on the bottom. Again, just for me personally, uh, the low boost didn't work for me on two bus work. I uh, found it more interesting on individual channels, but I did love the bass cut a little bit, and I really enjoyed when I found just the right sweet spot with, uh, with the high end boost and the interaction of the cut even without using it, uh, it did some amazing things to really bring some life uh, to some records, especially um, a great like instrumental prog hard rock record uh, that I mastered for a guy named Lucas Lee. This really brought a lot to the party. It was a great sounding uh, record in the end, and uh, this certainly was part of the party. So that's it, and if you want to hear um, how this track came out, go to kellybradley.com and check it out. And uh, you can actually see what Barry Corliss did with this track. And uh, I know for a fact that Barry uses in his uh, mastering rig a manly massive passive. So uh, just different approaches to passive EQ and uh, see what you think and support Kelly because she works hard and makes great music. I hope that was fun. I hope that helped a little bit. Again, don't forget to come by and visit us at recordingbootcamp.com. And I uh, would love it if you would subscribe to the videos and uh, definitely leave us a like or a comment. Or even if you don't like this, leave us a dislike. As long as uh, you're engaged and if you don't dig what we do, we love that kind of feedback too because it helps us do better things in the future. All right, that's it. Have fun and stay focused on the music.